Good. All right, I'm going to jump straight into the word. If you can turn to First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. I uh, I've started this series called Healthy Church, and I'm convinced that if you really believe with all your heart that the church, God's people, the ecclesia, are the answer for the world, then we've got to do some work on ourselves. We've got to go on a journey, not just a journey upward, which is to love God, not just outward, but it's to love people, but we need to go on a journey inward to love ourselves. Because Jesus said, uh, in answer to the question, what is the greatest command, said this, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God, which is the journey upward, to, to love, and to love your neighbor, which is the journey outward, as you love yourself, which is the journey inward. But Jesus said, as you love yourself. So it's important that we really learn to go on that journey inward to love ourself. That Jesus is going to come back when the bride, everyone say the bride, bride. has made herself ready has made herself ready. So we've got, so we can wait if your eschatology is just, everything is going to get worse and worse and worse, and then Jesus is going to show up um, and just appear. I think you might be disappointed when perhaps we come to the realization that actually um, he's going to come back when we've done our job. Amen. And so there's work that needs to be done, and that work starts with us. Come on. And this morning, uh, this really happened to me yesterday. I had, I had this moment um, we, I was in a funeral procession. I was driving with my blinkers on and the headlights, um, which is the only time it's, you can go through a red light, which is cool. But anyway, um, but I, I just had this moment. I don't know. I, I, and I, I've been very tender with you recently. I've been very vulnerable, even on a Sunday morning, because I'm determined to be real, even though... Uh, I don't want to just fake it and put on a good face and say, yeah, everything's great and just give script, but just to say, hey, this is, this is really where I'm at. But when we really are honest about where we're at, then we can get help, yeah. right? Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of those things today. Is that all right? Yeah. Let me just start with this scripture. Uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to read most of, most of the chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, I do not write to you, um, sorry, we do not need to write to you, for we know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in, in the night. People will be saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them. Now, everybody say them. This is really important because it's one of those passages when we don't read it right, we misquote it and we misunderstand it. And destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. But you, okay, so he's not talking about, he's not talking about us then, the destruction, but you, people of God, brothers, are not in darkness. So that this day should not surprise you like a thief. So often we pull scripture out of context. Well, the day will come like a thief in the night. Yeah, but not for us. I'm going to read it again. Right. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. Right. Ah, everyone can relax. Amen. That's why reading the text in context is really important. Okay, should we keep going? For you are sons of the light. Amen. Two domains. The domain of darkness... The marvelous kingdom of light. We were sinners, we were slaves, but now we're sons and we're daughters and we're saints. Amen. Okay? So you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night nor to the darkness. So then, let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be alert Amen. and let us be self controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. Yes. We don't like the word control, but the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Putting on faith and love as the breastplate and the hope and the salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Yeah. Hello. Come on. <laughs> but to receive salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up just as in fact you are doing. And then in verse 16, it says, be joyful always. I quote this scripture a lot. 
Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Ever wondering, Lord, what's your will? Be thankful always. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. Oh. Do not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Oh. But test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. And may the God, may God himself, the God of peace, listen to this, sanctify you through and through. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful to do this. Holy Spirit, thank you for this time. And Lord, in these short moments that we had together, I ask that you would just touch each one of us with your word, with your love, with your life, that you would help us this morning. Have a, a little greater glimpse into your glory, which is your nature. Amen. That we can leave here having had a greater understanding of what you're like. Amen. And a greater understanding of who we are to you. That we would be, really be, that we would grow up, that we would mature, that we would, as your word says, make ourselves ready so that the world will see you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Like many of you, this is a season, these last couple of years, where the world has been turned upside down. For some, it's been great. For some, it's been terrible. Some devastating. And in the midst of it, maybe a little bit of everything in between. And there's some, I'm, a, I'm definitely a glasses half full kind of guy. I'm pretty positive. I don't really get too down. But, you know, these last few months particularly, um, the feeling of loss and dealing with uh, the grief, the bereavement, the loss of, and the pain of losing people suddenly, losing people um, without notice, losing people and just feeling the pain of that. And those who've gone through that have know what that is like. And grief is, is weird. It's, it catches you off guard. There's different uh, phases of grief. There's, there's the denial stage. There's the blame stage. There's the anger stage. There's the acceptance stage. And they all happen in different orders with different people at different times. But one thing is the same, and that is the last is always acceptance and it's so important that when we are going through grief that we understand and we are kind to ourselves and we are kind to the people around us because we go through different stages and as I was driving in the funeral procession yesterday we were driving from the uh, funeral home to the church where the ceremony was taking place you know we were escorted through three different cities so the three different uh, police departments um, taking us through the red lights and I'm just following and there's this car that came up next to me and I glanced across and there was a young guy in this car that was clearly very important to him. He'd obviously spent a lot of money souping it up and making it very loud and he was completely oblivious to the fact that we were in a funeral procession and just cut in front of me and then tried to cut in front of the person next to them and I'm just driving thinking he's not just trying to be obnoxious, he's just completely oblivious. Until he got right to the front and realized there was a police escort and it was like suddenly it dawned on him and he just took off. After going to the, to the, uh, to the funeral itself, we got back into the funeral procession and went to the graveside. And on the way, this was quite quiet, it wasn't very far. And I'm just driving and I'm thinking, i trying to hold my, where am I at? Where are my emotions? And I, I don't feel particularly teary, I don't feel particularly, I feel very, very sad. And I just had this moment as we went through these lights and, and then we were driving along this road, this long straight road, and suddenly I became aware that the car on the other side coming towards me had stopped. And they'd opened their window and they just put their hand on their heart and they closed their eyes, causing a backup for all the traffic coming the other way, which were not required to stop. This time there was no police escort. There was no emergency vehicle. They just decided to stop and as they just because they decided to stop it caused everybody else to stop and there was just this deep sense of just respect and feeling and catching the moment of this large funeral procession that was going to a burial place and I caught the person's eye as I was driving and I just thought wow 
you stopped. And without any notice, I burst into tears. I just began to cry. And I thought they stopped. Someone stopped. And someone stopping caused everybody else to stop. Because they could feel the pain of the funeral procession and the people in the cars mourning the loss of a loved one. A loved one. And it took me by surprise and I was trying to catch my emotions as I pulled up to the graveside and I thought, they stopped. And I just thought, how often do we actually stop? Because when someone dies, everything stops. Everything. It doesn't, nothing matters anymore. My job doesn't matter. Nothing matters. It's to stop and gather thoughts and memories, gather our emotions to reflect on what could have been, to reflect on the good and bad, to reflect on last words, to reflect on all these things. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if sometimes we just stopped to love somebody stop to consider someone and their pain I just wonder because the truth is we never know what someone's going through I was walking on the street the other day and there was this lady she just walked past me just in floods of tears it was, I was awkward because I couldn't excuse me you're okay and you know, put my arm around her and say you know it would just be weird but somebody knows her how can we how can we how can we do this and I just thought, if the greatest command is to love the Lord with God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, I thought, what if, but, but, but surely it's not just me, but we're a part of the bride. We're a part of the church. But what if the church loved herself in a healthy way so much that we cared for the bride, we cared for one another so much? That the hallmark of the ecclesia, the hallmark of the church at large, was love. That they were so, people were so loved that that was what we reflected to the world. What would happen if the greatest command is to love? What would happen if we stopped so well and we loved so well that the church was attracted to the church because of love? What would happen if we, if we so redefine love God's way? Not weird, not sappy, but God love that is strong. God love that is powerful. That it was so attractive, so multifaceted. Because Jesus says, this then is how the world will know by your love for one another. Not just their love for them, but your love for one another. What would happen if we loved so well? What would happen if we cared for widows so well? What would happen if we cared for people in bereavement so well? What would happen if we, if we loved and cared for people so well that, we, that the world was like, how do you do that? What is that? Like, how? It's just the love of God. There's a man named uh, Bob Goff. Anyone heard of Bob Goff? Yeah. Wrote a book called Love Does. He was with my, my brother, who's, as you know, is in the process of moving with his family from San Diego, overlooking the ocean, to <laughs> sunny St. <Saint> Charles, Geneva. <laughs> He's <Yay>. so happy. <laughs> it's like 82 degrees all year round. <laughs> I was there recently and uh, I was watching the local news, the, the weather, and it says, um, t and today the beach is this temperature, the desert is this temperature, the city is this temperature, and the mountains are this temperature. I'm like, how can you have the mountains and the beach and the city in a desert in one city? And they do. And that's the temperature. Anyway, he was with Bob Goff. And someone said something about, I think, I believe it was the Packers baseball hat that Bob Goff was wearing. He said, oh, so you're a Packers fan? He said, no. And so in the end, someone asked him, why are you wearing a Packers hat? And he said, I don't even like the Packers. I don't even like baseball. Oh. <laughs> 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 
He said, I just, the reason I wear it is because I once prayed for this lady who was about to die. And as she was about to die, he said, what are you going to do with your hat? She said, here, you can have it. He said, I'll have it on one condition. I'll do you a deal. I will wear that hat every single day for the rest of my life. Every day. If every time you walk past Jesus, you mention my name. <laughs> and so she agreed. So every single day he wears this hat. And people shout at him at airports. They boo him. And he's like, you don't know me. You know, the truth is, we don't know people's situation, and yet we judge people all the time. So it's like, I don't even like sports. I just did this deal with this lady that every time that she saw Jesus, she just mentioned my name. Hey, just remember Bob Goff. I made a deal with him. Like, I don't know what's going on. That's But if the journey inward is a journey, there's three journeys to love God, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let's maybe, I want to suggest that we get really good at the journey inward to get our hearts healed up, to our hearts healthy in a way that they really love at full capacity. Not just our love, but a God kind of love. And you know, whatever's in your heart will come out of your mouth. I was with someone this week and we were waiting for a table in a restaurant and I'm just sitting there quietly and you know, I'm thinking about a whole bunch of stuff and they were just, they were mad that it was taking so long. And there was a, blah, 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 blah. they should know, they should, this is a restaurant, they, they we had a reservation or oh. And I just thought, really, dude, does it really matter? But my point is, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in someone's heart, in the end, will come out of their mouth. If there's anger in here, it will come out. If there's frustration in here, it will come out. If there's jealousy in here, it will come out. If there's unforgiveness in here, it will come out. Jesus said it. The abundance, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's in someone's heart, just listen to what will come out of their mouth. In the end, people's spirit will speak. I want to jump back in, if it's all right with you, um, to just talking a bit about the heart. I think last week I talked about significance. And I talked a little bit about awareness. Do you remember about awareness? And if you can, I, please, I love the word of God. I think I said this before. I'm, by nature, I'm more of a preacher, which is proclaiming, but teaching is explaining. And so I'm going to go a little bit slower, and I'm going to go into some examples that are not actually in the Bible, but it's okay. Is that all right? All right. Um, but there's something, I think, that is happening Right now, I'll say this is, this is happening in me, and, and it's a, a painful process at times, and I've, I've been here before, but, you, you know, it, after a while, we can, we, this stuff just happens, and we can stop, and we can kind of find facades without knowing it, not deliberately, of not actually revealing our true self. Uh, those of you know, I, I've um, been in the business of restoring buildings and buying and selling property in various different degrees. I don't do it much now, but back in England, obviously England's very, it's a much older country, um, there's houses go back, you know, some, one in Bath is like from the 1400s, and you can still go and visit if you go to the city of Bath where I grew up. But one of the things that happens over the years is because of fashion and design, people cover things up. So there was a, if you go through a, a, a phase where doors, um, the old barnwood doors or the stable doors or um, panel doors um, are no longer trendy. They put like um, plywood on top of them so they just look flat because that's the trend. And then it, it, it cycles round and it's not trendy anymore. So people have managed to spend money taking them off. And then they paint the wood and then they don't like the paint wood. So they strip the wood, you know. And so beams are the same. And these old beams, I once did a house that was 500 years old. The walls were made of like horse hair, which is how they made cement that back in those da days. And, um, and, you know, the floors were, you know, originally because it was just a dirt floor. That's where the word dirt poor came from, right? Dirt poor. Um, and because if you didn't, but if you had straw, then you'd have a threshold, and the threshold, which if you still use the word threshold, was the hole to hold the thresh in. So if you had more money in England, you would have thresh, you'd have straw on the ground, but if you didn't, you'd have just dirt, then you were dirt poor. Yeah. 
And so all these things you had to learn about restoring character buildings. But after a while, they would, you know, uh, it, even back then, it would be trendy in different uh, seasons to cover up the timber. So sometimes they'd box it, then they would paint it. And so my job was to restore it back to its original design. And that would take to a process of going through layer after layer after layer after a layer of paint. And you could see the different trends, like pea green. Obviously, it was very, very trendy at some point. Everything was pea green. The kitchens were pea green. They'd paint these old four, five hundred year old pieces of timber. And that's when they built it. But before that, they were from ships. So who knows how old these pieces of wood were. But they'd been painted with, with blues and greys and greens and pinks and blacks and purples. And, and then boxed. And then all oh, just... And you know, sometimes God does that with our lives. He takes, he starts to strip us back layer upon layer because he's trying to bring us back to our authentic self. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when we allow God to go on the journey inward and touch things deep in our heart, he's actually stripping things back. And that can get really painful. But there's something I believe the world more than any, any other time is looking for something that is authentic. I don't know if you've ever watched like American Idol or America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent, any of these shows. Um, but, you know, these people come on and they're so, they show their talent. And every, every now and again, you get somewhere, someone that isn't necessarily as put together. They're not so polished. They, they haven't got their act together. They've clearly not been trained. And they just get up there and you can see the, t the, the, um, the judges. They're like, really? They've already judged them. Like, this isn't going to work. Like, is this a joke? And then suddenly this person begins to sing. And as they begin to sing, there's such authenticity, there's such power, and they fill the room with something so beautiful that the judges begin to cry, and the, the place goes into a standing ovation, and people just won't stop applauding. Why? Because it was authentic. And church, I believe the world is looking for something authentic. Not to say it doesn't matter, the mind of the matter, we're just not going to confess it, we're not going to believe that, but to say, no, that really hurt, but God. Mm -hmm. but God. I, I feel, I'm going through the same thing. The difference is I have a hope. Yes. Yeah. We grieve not as those who have no hope. That doesn't mean we don't grieve. It just means the way we grieve is different. Yes. Yes. Adele was doing a great performance. Adele is another uh, a great example of someone who is so authentic. She's got this powerful voice, but she's just so down to earth. And she was doing a tribute to, um, to George Michael. Do you remember George Michael? And um, the PA went out. The sound went down. Everything went quiet. The room was full of celebrities and musicians from around the world. And it's just, she's just there in silence. And she just said, you know what? Stuff happens. In honor of George Michael, we're just going to leave everything as it is, and we're just going to we're going to we're just going to wait until the PA's back because we're going to do this right because I just really want to honor this man's legacy. And everybody went to applause. Why? Because she just owned the moment and she was real. Mm. At Times Square, Mariah Carey, the same thing happened to her. She stormed off, never to come back. I keep getting trouble saying some of these things, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> What's my point? Whatever, let's, can, can you see where I'm going with this? Is authenticity, the real you, what's the real you will come out. And I believe God is look, wanting us to go for a journey where we understand that our significance is not found in what we do or how we perform, but it's found in him. And that takes a journey of discovery to go on that journey of truth deep on the inside. I'll change, uh, I'll change stories to go a bit more British now. But um, Gordon Brown, one of the uh, pre previous uh, British prime ministers, um, was in a press com conference. He was running for re-election. And somebody without, without uh, you know, and sometimes when the press, they catch somebody that wasn't pre-approved. <laughs> and this person starts asking him questions. And he very eloquently, in a very dignified manner, answered the question really, really well. And people were like, well, that's great. It was a very difficult question. And then he was taken to his limousine and put into his limousine. And he just started to go off. 
what the blankety blank the blank happened there? Who does that guy think he is? And why wasn't he screamed when he didn't realize his mic was still on? And it went right across the world and he didn't get reelected. Why? Because wow. he just proved that that was not his authentic self. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, he doesn't care <laughs> whether he's in private or he's in public. That's the public. This is me. And one of the things that people do like about Donald Trump, and this is not a political statement at all, is you know what you're going to get. Whether you, even, whether you agree with him or not, he's going to say what he really thinks. Because he just thinks it. Sometimes he doesn't really think about what he's going to say. He just says what he thinks. But the reason people love him, not everybody, but some people love Donald Trump is because you know it's authentic. I'll move on. Mm. The best communicators in the world move from their heart. And their, their material is secondary, but they spend most of their work on their internal ecosystem, which is their heart. And I'm saying this because God cares about our heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And life and death are in the power of the tongue. Words have creative power. So if we're going to love God well, we're going to love ourselves well, we're going to love one another so well that the world will say, what on earth is that? I have never seen love like that. How did you do that? How did you fix that communication? How did you get through that conflict? How does your marriage still stay together? How do you, how, how, how do you love people that other people don't love? How, do, how is it that you're just not judging people because you don't know their story like Bob Goff? How, how does this work? Yeah. It works because it's the greatest command. It works because it's a kingdom principle. Yeah. It works because we're following the instruction manual written by the king himself. Yeah. You can't be present if it's not you talking. I've, some of these notes I've pulled out that I've written over the last few years, some of which I've spoken and some of them I haven't, but I catalogue these things because they help me grow. They help me think. They help me examine. They help me navigate. But I, I, I do think over the last few weeks I've been writing on, on finding my why. What is the why? Why do you do what you do? And this won't be a surprise to many of you, but I, I think this might help you on your journey of knowing yourself, loving yourself, so that you can better love the person next to you. And by loving the person next to you, by loving your wife, by loving your kids, by loving your family, by loving your husband, by loving your, your, your colleagues at work, would be to best understand you. Because you can only love as much as you love yourself. You can only love as you love yourself. Yeah. So what a great journey to go on inside of yourself. Why am I the way I am? Why do I think the way I am? Why do I do what I do? And so many of, probably this, the, 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 some of the biggest corporations in the world, they have a why and they stick to their why. Why do they do what they do? And what we look at is we look at the outward, uh, uh, we look at the outside, we look at the shell and we say, well, it's obviously that. Starbucks, for instance, if you look at Starbucks, you think then Starbucks is all about Coffee, but it's actually not. Actually, the why was originally um, created. Let's there's three places in, in, in life that people work. There's there's work. There's the hof, there's the there's the home. But what about the in between? Let's find a space for people in between the office and the home. And they created Starbucks. The coffee is not actually the why. The same with Airbnb. Now, 130 billion dollar organization. <coughs> There's over 150 million places to stay. But George Gerber, I said this, some of my illustrations are not going to be from the Bible today, but it's okay. 
right, I'm going somewhere with this. I'll... George Gerber, the owner, said that I was actually in San Francisco and he, uh, there was nowhere to stay. And so he found a, he asked a friend, could I stay in your flat on the floor? Do you have an air mattress? And his friend said, yeah, you can stay on my air mattress. And then he found himself staying in San Francisco and actually experiencing San Francisco, experiencing the culture, experiencing actually what it is like to live in someone's home on an air mattress as opposed to being in a hotel where you're not really experiencing the full culture. You're just in a chain hotel. Airbnb came from air mattress. Because there was something authentic. There was something about the, uh, uh, is, there, is there a place, is there a space where we can, uh, where, where instead of having just somewhere to stay, see, it's not actually just about accommodation like Starbucks isn't about coffee. The why is, what is there when we go to, if we go to a city or we go to a country or we go to a place that we've never been before where we can actually experience the culture And it answers a lot of different whys. Expense of a hotel. Eliminated. The experience of a hotel. I've been to India, I think, nine times. I love India. My mother grew up in India. Yay. It's, a, it's, a wonderful, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful country. But I remember one time going with people, and they just stayed in different hotels and got in an air-conditioned coach, and they didn't really experience... India. They just got off at the tourist park. But, I, but if you want to really experience the culture, that's what the, the thinking behind Airbnb. Maybe you could stay actually in someone's home. The other thing, of course, is that air, that spare room is now becomes an income generating room for someone who has a spare room that doesn't use it. So it starts to answer questions. And that's the why. So it's not actually accommodation. Same with Uber. The person driving along with Uber couldn't get home one day. And he said, I want, and so in the end, he said, can I pay you, can I pay you to take me home? And the guy said, yes. And he thought, gosh, there must be a way that we could do this. People don't like getting into a taxi in the middle of the night. They don't like dealing with cash in the middle of the night in perhaps a city they don't know or an area they don't really know. And I don't, but, 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 but what if I paid online? What if there was a way of um, having this transaction that was really safe? And I knew that Airbnb had vetted these people and this is, but I can really, I can get to know the, this is more authentic. Yeah. And we will eliminate some of the taxi services and, and on and on it goes. I could go on, guys, with so many different, same with Netflix, just the, the why behind what we do. And the reason I'm just putting this out there, I know we haven't got much time left and we're going to pray in a moment, but I, I, I want to provoke us to go on a journey inside of ourselves to ask our, ourselves that question, what is our why? Why do I do what I do? And I think it's a question, that why, that, that, is that we need to establish in our own hearts. Why are we here on planet Earth? When we gave our lives to the Lord, why? And what is the big why as to what we, what we should be doing here on planet Earth? And one of the things I'm suggesting this morning is that we really learn to love ourselves. And I think I said this last week, but one of the things that is, is the church has done is said, well, you need to die to yourself. And we've kind of eliminated self. But I, I, I want to suggest that we challenge that thought and relook at it. Apple. The why is simplicity. That's it. To take something very complex and make it very, very simple. A man named Jim Carrey. Anyone heard of Jim Carrey? Can I go a little bit more? Is this, is this boring? Is this, is this helpful? I know this is a little bit different, but... When Jim Carrey was 20, 28 years old, he was in L.A. And he went back to his cheap hotel room. And he looked back over the last 10 years of his life. And he asked himself this question. He was 28. He said, I've got no money, but why do I do what I do? 
And he went through this list. He said, do I do it for the money? He asked himself, no. Do I do it for fame? No. Do I do it for health? No. Do I do it for laughs? No. And he thought about what people had said to him over the years. And he remembered people saying, I bought my mum who had cancer. I was going through a really rough time. And when we came to your performance... I was freed from my concerns. I was freed from my concerns. And Jim Carrey thought to himself, that's my superpower. I can free people. Now, this is, this is the world now. I'm provoking you through this. Stay with me. That's my superpower. Comedy was the product, not the why. Freeing people from concerns. And he started that day, he wrote it down, I'm going to start an FFC, freeing people from concerns. Free from concern. Free from concern. So he, now he is in the business of mental health. Unsaved. If by 35... Sorry, by 30, he was offered the role in Ace Ventura. By 35, he was a multi-millionaire. At 34, he did Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Split room again. <laughs> but he answered the question of the why. What problem am I solving? And the problem that Jesus solved was the problem of sin and access to him and having a relationship with him. And we are ambassadors of that truth. Living no longer as slaves and sinners, but as people that are sons and daughters loved by him. And as I read in First Thessalonians, God is not mad with us. He's not going to come like a thief in the night for us. And I want to just provoke us today. I'm going to pray that we go in a journey. And I, we need to know in Hebrews it says... Consider how you can prov provoke one another, spur one another on. And if today I just did that, I provoked you a little bit to, hey, maybe I need to stop and examine. Maybe I need to stop and just take inventory. Maybe I need to stop and, and go on a little bit of a journey inward to really allow God to really love me. So good. And in doing so, maybe it will cause me to stop even stop people behind me, even to stop traffic all the way to Geneva, to cause people to say, there's something going on here, can you see? There's something that going on here that's not actually about me, but it's actually really important because it affects someone else. And actually now it is affecting me. And actually, I have an answer here. Because I know the great comforter. I know the answer. And I'm, I can give it away. So can we stand together? close your eyes for you. Father, I thank you for everybody in this room. I thank you for those watching online, those who are watching later. I thank you that wherever we are right now in our journey, wherever we are in life, you know us and you meet us right there. And I thank you Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross. Thank you that we have access to the Father because of you. Thank you that we can come boldly before your throne of grace and receive mercy in our time of need. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that today would be a day where we examine hurts, 
hang-ups, habits, things that have lodged their way into our own hearts that have perhaps stopped us, stopped us either loving you, loving others, or loving ourselves. And today, that you would touch each one of our hearts, that healing would come. Lord, for those who just need to ask for forgiveness, the simple act of putting something right and repenting and asking for your forgiveness, that you would grant us that complete forgiveness. Because your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us for all unrighteousness. And Lord, I ask that each one of us would leave here knowing we're forgiven today, knowing that we're free. And I ask, Lord, that you would build us just in this community, that you would build a community of people that know how to love one another well. Lord, like a chiropractor, that you would adjust us today, that we would take our gaze off ourselves, and we would see people through a new light. And Lord, I ask that we would stop. We would stop and see people through new eyes. That we would stop and feel the pain that others have gone, going through or have gone through. That we would stop to give a gift. We would stop to ask someone their name. We would stop to pray with someone. We'd stop to put something right with someone. We'd stop to communicate and communicate well. God, we recognize that all these things can only be received. They can never be achieved. And they are received by starting with you and receiving your love. So right now, church, just lift your hands out and say, Jesus, I just receive a fresh dose of your love, a fresh dose of your acceptance, a fresh dose of your kindness, and I receive it. I receive your forgiveness, Lord. If you need to put something right, just say, Lord, please will you forgive me right here, right now. And receive it. Mm. Let times of refreshing just come to you.